Let me talk to you about the fourth week of our series. If you've missed any of the weeks of this series, you can go online and check them out. We've been unpacking some of these lines and phrases that we love to say to people, and we've been talking about how in a moment they may sound really nice, but they may not be really helpful when we break them down. They may not be very biblical when we break them down. And the person on the other end of some of these quotes and things that Christians love to share, especially Christians, uh, they, I mean, they take them seriously sometimes coming from Christians. And, and sometimes the person on the receiving end of these quotes and phrases could hear something coming from us, believe it to be true, though it may not be true, and it can affect them deeply, and sometimes in a very negative way we're not aware of. So I just want to bring another one to your attention here today. Week four, tabloid Jesus. Here's our tabloid statement that people love to share. When people are hurting, they'll share this line. Here it is. God took your loved one because God must have needed another angel. And uh, probably some of you, like every other week of this series, have been going, oh, I shouldn't, I didn't know that. I, I've said that to people. And I get your heart probably why you said that to somebody. You were trying to help them. You thought you were helping. Uh, you shared that because it, it sounded really nice. And, and so I, I get that. I think, you know, sometimes Hollywood loves to feed us things that are not true. In fact, a lot. And Hollywood has loved for the years, over the years, to portray angels to us. I, I know during the holiday season, we watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and Clarence comes in his angel, you know, in this human form to get his wings. And you see stuff like that, and, and that's very beautiful, and Clarence is really cute. And so we kind of buy into that, I guess, enough of that. We don't maybe study God's word to understand the truth about things like this. And so we just kind of say, I guess maybe that's real, even though it's not real. Uh, we, we hear phrases like this. We're on the receiving end of phrases like this. It can be very difficult when somebody, you're, you're, you're at a funeral and you're grieving the loss of somebody who's a loved one, a child, a son or a daughter or a brother or sister, mother or father. Somebody says, yeah, you know, the reason you lost your loved one was God just kind of plucked him away because he needed another angel. And, and, and that can be tough to be on the receiving end of hearing. Again, I'll, I'll share with you why. I think we have a we do have a desire deep down, I think, to share and even to receive some sort of thing that gives us a hope, you know, that my loved one is living forever, that my, my loved one is suffering no more. Uh, the Bible says that eternity has been placed in the hearts of humanity. And so we want to know, like, what comes after death, uh, what, what awaits us. Uh, we have a longing to understand that. And sometimes we also want to help people see that. The Bible says that God will indeed wipe away every tear. So trying to explain that or help somebody with that can be very, very much good intentions, but to use some of these phrases, these platitudes that we use can be very bad Bible, very bad theology. I want to give you some problems with the statement so that you'll be aware, and then give you a, really maybe a helper, say, okay, well, what can I do when people are hurting? And so let me share this with you. Problem number one with the statement uh, that uh, God must have needed another angel and that's why he took your loved one is this, that God doesn't need another angel because he doesn't need anything. If God is incomplete, then that is not the God that we serve. Uh, we have a holy, uh, complete, incredible God who created angels, he absolutely did. If, if you don't believe in angels, then you don't believe your Bible because your Bible says there's angels. Uh, we're just dealing with the question of does our loved one become an angel? But this mentality of this statement is like, okay, God surveyed the world and said he wasn't complete, he needed your loved one. Uh, every year I go on a trip, I go on a wild at heart trip, I, I do a little camping, I'm in the wilderness, take a group of men, we're going again in September. And every year I feel like, you know, my list is incomplete. You know, I, I get there and I've left, I've left stuff behind that I've known for 10 years to take and I left it. And so maybe I have to stop by a store on the way up or, 
you know, I make it a list, I come back, I go to the camping store when I get back or whatever the store is that sells that gear and I go pick up a couple items because I want the next trip to be better than the last. It was not complete the way that I wanted and all the accommodations that I was looking for. So I pick up a few more little items to make the trip just a little bit better. And I think that's a snapshot of who we are in humanity. We're always looking to maybe add a couple things, make us feel better, just one more of this, one more of that, make a little list, acquire a few things, and maybe we'll feel a little bit more complete. And maybe we kind of say, okay, well, maybe God is that way as well. You know, he's looking over humanity. Maybe he didn't make enough angels. He looks at you and I. He's at the camping store going shopping. Oh, I need that one. No. Our God's not doing that. God didn't need your loved one to complete something. It says this in this ancient, most ancient text in the Bible in Job 38 and verse 4. God speaking to Job where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And what were its footings, on what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy. A God created angels. He made them in creation and he's not sitting back going oh okay now I need need something more to complete this thing that he's he's doing let me let me give you uh something else in your notes problem number two we say this statement and we start making God look really petty and cruel and there's there's different reason sometimes we're trying to explain things and we it's almost like we're explaining things in a way that we're presuming or assuming that we know what God's doing and in those responses it, it can look kind of odd to somebody or sounds like kind of odd on the receiving end receiving in Job let's go back to Job for just a moment he's lost his wealth he's lost his family he's lost his health his friends come to his side which is important when you're hurting having friends come to your side is important the problem is they go a little too far because they try to start explaining why all this is happening to Job. And they're trying to say, well, this may be, you know, maybe you sinned, Job. And maybe you made some mistakes. Maybe you did something wrong. And this is why it's happening. You've lost a loved one because you've been, you're being punished. God speaks up to Job's friends and says this in Job 42 and 7. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken, you're not speaking the what? The truth about me as my servant Job has. It, oh, hey, hey, you sinned. I'm taking your loved one now. That, that, how does that, that makes God look very petty, and cruel, and again, this, this effort to maybe explain away something. Let me give you problem number three. We deny people the right to grieve when we do this. It may not even be intentional, but sometimes the way it's coming out, it's like we're trying to deny them the right to grieve because what we're doing is giving a very nice phrase or platitude in hopes of making them feel better, but when you're on the receiving end of it, it's almost like, you're telling me, if you're saying this to me, hey, I got great news. You don't need to cry anymore. Uh, your loved one's an angel. So feel better. And grief is important. Grief is something that we go through. There's a, a part of grief that if we can go through it right and healthy can, can allow us to be healthier in the long run, even though it's hard in the moment. We don't just shove grief aside. Grieving's a part of what we go through in life. We were created in the image of God, and we grieve when we feel a sense of a loss of love. In fact, I wrote this in my notes. Grief honors love. Grief honors the depths of how much you loved somebody that you lost. We give these words to somebody saying it's almost like, hey, cheer up. Please, please. We, we do cry. Uh, we do grieve. I know there's men, and I've talked about this before, there's men, and maybe you're here in this audience, and you had a father who told you, hey, son, men don't cry. Suck it up, because men don't cry. And I don't mean to be mean to your dad. I'm sorry if he's here with you and he said this to you, but it's not true. 
uh, last I looked, you have tear ducts. And Jesus wept. And he was a dude. And so tears do matter. They are a part of the process. Grieving is a part of the, can people get stuck in the grieving process? Absolutely. And there's helpers for that as well. We, we, we have to understand sometimes we're, we're trying to like wrap something up in a nice neat package in hopes that maybe they'll just feel better. And they, they've got to go through the, this process of grieving. And here's the next thing in your notes. Problem number four. In doing all of this, we're creating this distorted image of God. That God really is shopping. He's looking down like in a video game sort of mentality. Pew, pew, you're out. I'm taking that one with me. And through all of these things that we've shared over the last several weeks of this series, many times giving this distorted image of God is, is not helpful. Problem number five in your notes, this is important for this phrase that we're dealing with here today because people don't become angels. And I have good news. What God does with humanity in eternity is better than the angels. And so I need you to know that, but if you read your Bible, you understand people don't become angels. And that's why that statement is so difficult, uh, I think, to share with people because it, it isn't accurate. Over the years, I mentioned before, we've had TV shows, broadcast things people put out there to try to portray angels. I remember many, many, probably a couple decades ago, uh, Michael Landon from Little House. Anybody know Michael Landon was on Little House on the what? All right, some older folks know for sure anyways. Maybe some, maybe some of the younger ones do as well. I've heard of some young people watching those shows. But, uh, you know, I, this is how the angel is portrayed. There he is. You know, Michael, Michael Landon, and, and it's nice. And, and so we have Hollywood telling us that this is what an angel looks like. But the truth is, is angels are described in the Bible in different ways, different types of angels. And over the years, people have tried to depict in drawings what actual biblical angels look like. And there's many different versions of these and, and trying to understand what, what an actual biblical angel would look like. And so here's, here's one image, you know, of a depiction of what a biblical angel would look like. We'll put it up on the screen there. And so now all of a sudden you're thinking, uh, my grandpa's watching over me looking like this. I don't know, you know. What about the next one here? Here's another of another type of angel. Ooh, this is like, uh, hush, little baby, don't say a word. Metallica, for those of you who are not aware. And so, I mean, this is, uh, I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, angels are real, they are real, but they're not human. And being clear about that is important because, as I said before, you have an opportunity in the things that God has done in humanity to take a place that is so much greater than the angels. Angels are created for specific purposes. Human beings were created and are created for specific purposes. Angels and people do have some similarities. We have intelligence, we have emotions, we have will, we worship God in eternity, but we're not equal, we're not the same. In Psalm 8 and 5, it says this, God, you have made them, human beings, you've made human beings a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. A couple things that are just in this text here alone. You've made human beings, here we are on, on earth, we're lower than the angels, but then it talks about this glory, it talks about this honor that humanity is able to receive, and we'll see in a second, it is above the angels. So we have a unique positioning that's it's critical. Angels are a spiritual, supernatural being, but they were made to carry out the will of God in a different way than you and I are made. Two tasks, though, specifically in your notes that we know angels are involved in. There are a few, but I'm going to give you a couple here today. Uh, number one, angels are worshipers. In Revelation 7, 11, all angels, all the angels, they were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. So they worship and they worship endlessly, but here's another thing about angels. Angels are messengers and they have 
uh, throughout history. It's recorded in the scriptures. Angels have delivered messages to humanity on behalf of God. And we see that taking place over and over. The word angel literally means, in, in the Greek and the Hebrew, means messenger. Uh, Gabriel comes and explains and, and delivers the message of explaining dreams and visions to, to Daniel. Angels announce the arrival, a messenger of, they're the messengers of the arrival of Jesus Christ. Angels ministered to Jesus after his temptation in the wilderness and acts an angel helped Peter escape from prison. When the woman, when the women went to the, to the tomb in Luke chapter 24 and they see that the tomb is empty, uh, the angels are there to proclaim to those ladies that Jesus is risen. They're delivering messages. But humans are different. Humans are created in the image of God. Angels are not described that way. Humans have a unique relationship with God. Humans are set to be, designed to be the sons and daughters of God, heirs to live forever with Christ. We were redeemed by the blood of God's son. Angels are not redeemed. And that's critical. Because when somebody gives of their life for you to be redeemed... The Bible says that's the greatest love for anybody known. God does that for humanity. Humans have redemption, and they can discover a love that angels cannot discover. And that's why it's important to know that there's a distinction, and there's a value in the way God has set up humanity versus the way he set up angels. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, it says this, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of these things that have now been told, you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Look here, this is an important line in this. Even the angels long to look into these things. Even the angels are looking at the things of the gospel, redemption for humanity, our ability to connect with God the way we can connect with God and worship and serve him, the angels are looking down, go, they're looking going, wow, look what they get to be a part of. They long to understand what you and I have in humanity and our unique relationship with God. Hebrews 1 verse 13, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation sent to serve us, those of us serving God, serving humanity in a way that's unique, those of us who inherit something special, salvation. So I said before, we're, in Psalm 8, 5, we're made lower than the angels. But because of our connectivity with God, when we draw our last breath, we spend an eternity in heaven we get a placement that's above the angels. Chad Bird, who, said, who talked about the difference between angels and our place and all of this with God, he, he wrote this once. He said, now let's imagine for a moment that our loved ones do become angels when they die. What an everlasting disappointment that would be. No longer would they be humans with who Jesus shares the unique bond of flesh and blood. No longer would they be those who reign with him. No longer would they be kings and queens created in the image and likeness of God. No longer could they say, Christ died for me. It is therefore the best news that when Christians die, heaven does not get another angel. We cannot become angels any more than we can become giraffes, ocean waves, or stars. We are people, and we remain so after this present life. God did not make a mistake when he made us human. We have this special bond with God, and it is powerful. We embrace that bond. Those of us who understand this, and we've discovered redemption a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the prodigal son and the power of this, this portrait of the father waiting for the son to come home with open arms, the father longing to forgive the son, to embrace the son. And when you encounter that, and those of you that have encountered that, you know the incredible encounter, knowing that your sin has been forgiven and that connection with God. And the Bible is telling us that is a connection the angels do not have. When you come up here and be baptized, 
We're having baptisms in just a little bit. Some of you have already been baptized. That baptism is a portrait that, that, that I had that embracement with the heavenly father. My sin has been forgiven. I, I have this new life in Christ and I want other people to know that I have discovered that. You haven't, maybe you're here, you, you haven't been baptized. Maybe you came to know Christ a week ago, two weeks ago, months ago, years ago. Baptism is a big deal. Because number one, Jesus told us to be baptized, and so that already makes it a big deal. But number two, we, go, we put on display this incredible thing that God did for us that even the angels don't have. Redemption found in the love and the connection to the Father through the forgiveness of sin through the Son, Jesus Christ. It's a big deal when you're baptized. You are letting people know you found that most powerful love. Supernatural. Supernatural something only human beings can have reserved for them. And maybe you have a next step of being baptized. Maybe you're taking that step today. Maybe you're saying, well, I didn't come here planning on being baptized. That's okay. At least five or six people we baptized this weekend. They, they just came forward with what they were wearing. We've got shirts we give you to change into. We've got towels for you to dry off with. Uh, so we got all that. We'll help you. Uh, if you could just say, oh, you know what, I, I, I'm a believer and I've not been baptized, then you can come forward in just a little bit when we do baptisms and take that step, that proclamation of faith. Uh, I've spent some time over the last few weeks shooting some holes in some really nice statements. Like I, I know week one we said, God doesn't give you more than you can handle was really a messy statement. And some of you are like, man, I had that one in my, that's part of my, my, my toolbox of words to say. And we took that one off the table. And then so maybe you say, well, you use this, God, God must have needed another angel and now I've shot that one down. And you're like, man, that's two out of my toolbox. All right, Gary, give us something. I'm going to give you something to remember when people are hurting for you to help them. But I want us to re be reminded that yeah, we, we will have pain in this world, and death is the greatest of all pain. We know this, that death is certain for everybody here in this room. Our bodies are fallen, and we're in a fallen world, and they are broken, and there will come a time where all of us draw our last breath. It's all around us. It touches everybody. It is the final enemy to be put under Jesus' feet. It is painful. It brings sting, and we grieve but we are reminded that Jesus has overcome it. In Romans 8 and verse 18, it says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed for us for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they have already have? No, but if we hope for what we don't have yet, we wait patiently and we draw our last breath and that hope that we've been longing and waiting for becomes a reality. We can't see it until we're there. But we keep that hope in mind while at the same time we're grieving. In Christ we are not angels. In Christ we're not like angels. In Christ we are more than angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge uh, to, to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things then of this life? Chad Burt said this uh, further about believers when we, when we die. When believers die in Christ, we will go to be with our Lord in paradise and await the time when he will return with us to establish the new heaven and the earth, raise the dead, give us new and glorious bodies. Then we will live and rejoice in new creation that will have no end to the everlasting joy of the ministering angels around the throne. Let me give you the solution to what we can do when people are hurting. Just, just some helpers, and I'm sure there's a few more, but I just, just give you a few things to, to remember uh, when people are hurting. And so here's the first thing I put in your notes. Just mourn with them. Uh, as believers, we, we hurt when people hurt. And, and, it, and it's okay for that to just be the baseline. We rejoice when people rejoice. But when people are hurting, 
it's okay to just hurt with them. You know that Jesus arrives on the scene one time, his good friend has passed away, Lazarus. He's been dead for several days and Jesus is there, his friend is dead and Jesus' friends are there and they are mourning and they are grieving. And when Jesus arrives, the Bible says that he wept. In fact, maybe you came today and you want to memorize a verse in the Bible. I'll give you a really easy one. Jesus wept. But it's important to remember this because this is the first thing. He's there with the friends and he weeps. And they're hurting. And it's okay to mourn with people and just spend time doing that. I wrote this down in your notes. Less words and more presence. Just being there is sometimes all you can do. I know we look for the words. We really do. We look for the words and we want to wrap it up in a neat package and we're really trying to help them. I know we're really trying to, but those words sometimes can get a little bit messy and so I think many times just people being there by somebody's side is a big deal. Less words. Job chapter two, in verse 13, we we remember earlier I said sometimes Job's friends were trying to explain things and God had to correct them, but there was a time, you know, as Job was hurting where his friends understood the importance of just being there. And here's what it says in verse 13. It says, and then they sat on the ground with him, with Job, for seven days and seven nights, and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And sometimes we can do that, and it's the best thing we can do, and, and it's what we really need at times in our life as well when we're hurting we don't do groups just so that people can have people to grieve with, but it is one of the things that can come out of your engagement in small groups here at our church. These are the groups that meet throughout the week. We launch a new round of these every few months, and we've got a, another round of groups that are beginning in just a few weeks. They'll last through multiple weeks of the summer. And it's an opportunity for you to start getting connected with people who grieve and be by your side and care for you when you're hurting. It, not everybody experiences this because maybe they're kind of do a group and then they don't ever do another group. But you start digging into groups at our church and you start making connections that get a little deeper, a little more rich. Uh, we put together, we're in the tabloid series, so we, we made a tabloid called The Sun. The S-O-N, you see what we did there, right? Very creative. <laughs> Anyways, uh, inside is all kinds of little Bible study groups that you can be a part of over the summer. On the back is a whole other set of groups called ING groups. These are activity-based groups. Very easy to, if you've never been in a group, a good first step to enter into a group with us here at the church or maybe a little extra group that you do if you've been in groups regularly here. Uh, I'm leading one with ba a basketball group on Thursday nights coming up in a few weeks. And so it's on the back here as well. Others of you might find another activity-based group that you want to be a part of. I want to challenge you on your way out. In the hallway on the right-hand side, they're giving these out. You can take one, pick through, find a group, and take the step of going online and getting registered or you can pick out a group and go right over to the connect table on the left side of the hallway and tell them what group you want to be in and they will register you on the spot right here at the church. Sometimes we are looking for words. And the words just aren't often helpful. We say things like, hey man, I've been there. I know what you're going through. No, you don't. I know how it feels because... No, you, you, everybody's situation is, is unique. In fact, I wrote this down in my notes. Everyone deserves the dignity of their own pain. Everybody's pain is personal and unique. Sometimes these words don't connect the way that we think they are. Sometimes it's okay to just say, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand, and, and, and I'm, hurting, I'm hurting with you, and I don't know what you're going through, but I'm sorry. And then the last thing I put in your notes is where you can do something. Many times when people are hurting, we'll come up to them and we'll say, what can I do for you right now? 
and the person will respond, I, I can't think of anything right now. I'm, I, I don't know. Maybe they do tell you something, and then, of course, you have an actionable step. But sometimes they'll put up a little front, and they'll just say, and, and sometimes it's just so chaotic in their mind, they can't think of anything. And this is, I think, easy for us to hear at times because it means, oh, okay, good. I don't have to do anything for them. They didn't give me something to do. We were asking, but we didn't really mean it. We were kind of hoping they would say, no, nothing right now. We kind of push past that and we say, okay, I'm going to find something for you. I'm, I don't know. Like, I'm gonna, maybe it's just sending flowers. Maybe, it's, maybe it is uh, just being by their side. Maybe there's a task around the house that you can do for them or watch their kids for a period of time or something like that. And you, just, you take the extra step to step into just helping in some way possible. After all of these things that we're, we're talking about here today, that the reminder from Jesus, and you know, he raised Lazarus from the dead. I talked to you about how he arrived. He was, he was grieving uh, there with them, but he did raise Lazarus from the dead. And, and it's a powerful part of the story about Lazarus. But in the middle of all of that, in John 11 and verse 25, it says this, Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. No one... Or it says, it says this, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. But, and whoever lives by believing in me, look, will never die. And then Jesus says, do you believe this? This is, this is how people come to me, Jesus. This is how they come to the Father. This is how their life is resurrected. This is how death is overcome. And maybe after a bit of ministering and caring for somebody, you have an opportunity to share this hope with them. Maybe after a bit of loving and caring, you remind them of this hope that they already have or their loved one had. It starts with us just being there, weeping with them, avoiding the platitudes and all the little sayings we like to come up with and just, just loving them. So we don't know why things happen and we don't understand all these things, but we know we can be there and we know the message of Jesus Christ is the greatest hope on the planet. Let me pray for you as we close out our time together. God, we're coming to you and we just give thanks to there is a resurrected life that awaits those who believe and God help us to be reminded of truths in the Bible and things that are fictional and things that don't always help people. Help us to, to learn that sometimes the best thing we can do is just be by people's side and grieve with them help them as they're hurting. God, we know that you gave your son Jesus to overcome death, hell, and the grave. And tonight we're grateful, this, this afternoon we're grateful for that. But I want to I wanna just challenge the person that's here today that's not a believer. That text that we just read, Jesus says, I am the resurrected life believe in me, believe in the resurrected life. He said, do you believe this? Do you believe me? Maybe somebody here right now, that's the question for you. Do you, do you believe it? Yes or no? Like, do, do you believe he is the way to the Father or not? It, it's certainly not gray. It's black and white. Do you believe it or not? Maybe some of you say, yeah, I, I believe that now, but I've never communicated with God that I believe that that Jesus is the resurrected life that he did come as God's son to be the forgiveness for humanity I believe that today and you can take that step today to say God I'm turning my life over to you I surrender to you I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord that he came to forgive me of my sin and make me connected now as a forgiven person connected to the heavenly father to have a relationship with him that is beyond anything of the angels and God I receive that gift of forgiveness and redemption today through the work of the cross what Jesus Christ has done for humanity I'm ready to begin a journey with you God in Jesus name amen